All right, section 8.5, we're going to take a look at something called partial fractions or partial fraction decomposition. And the majority of what we do in this section is not calculus. Yeah, I know, it's crazy. Um, it's actually algebra, and if you were to get like a college algebra textbook, it's one of those sections at the end that typically no one ever gets to. And it's kind of okay, because most people who take college algebra are not going to find themselves in this class right now, correct? Um, and so it's one of those things that when you do teach college algebra, you know you're not going to get to it. You probably don't even plan to get to it, and it's really not an irrelevant thing. But it is a college algebra concept, okay? Um, but the thing is that you don't really need this college algebra concept until you get to Calc 2 right here. And so we can kind of delay doing it for that purpose. That said, I did have one student I tutored once upon a time eons ago who was in a, a college algebra course, and we did get to it. And, I mean, her class did. It wasn't my class, but her class actually did get to it, and, and we worked through it. Uh, and it's challenging because it's a very challenging algebra kind of concept, um, but I think you guys are going to be fine with it. So let's take a look. Um, the slide where we write all the details down is worse than actually doing it. That happens a lot uh, with mathematics, so we're going to go through this. Um, our fractions are going to look like numerator over denominator, so we're calling it n of x over d of x. Um, the first step in this process is to divide if the degree of the numerator is greater than or equal to the degree of the denominator. The ones we're going to be doing as examples don't have this feature, and in fact, most, if not all of the ones you do, just aren't going to have this. But if they do, and you've seen this before, you're going to do long division. So that's step one. Step two is to factor the denominator usually happens pretty quickly. Step three is to write the denominator as a summation of fractions with each factor of d of x as a separate denominator. Step four is to write each numerator with a degree one less than the denominator. And there is um, kind of a, uh, I'll, I'll, I don't know how I want to say this, um, we'll say with exceptions. We will see an exception to this, and I'll explain why the exception happens. And then step five is to reconcile the created summation with the original function. Um, the steps two through four go really quick. Those are very, very fast steps. Step five is where we spend the bulk of our time. And you can see the disclaimer at the bottom is exactly what I said before. This really isn't calculus. Um, but we need this college algebra or this algebra concept in order to be able to find some integrations that otherwise we really wouldn't have a good way to do it with. Okay? good? Okay. Anybody good? Okay. All right. Here's an example. If you take a look at this one, it says use partial fractions to integrate. I mean, that's fine. That's the directions. But if you didn't have those directions and you were just told to integrate, you would be stuck. This does not have any of the forms we've talked about. Um, a lot of times when we see uh, an x squared in the denominator, we think u substitution. But if you let the denominator be u, there's no du, right? You'd get a derivative that looks like 8x, and that there's no x anywhere else to associate with the du. So that doesn't work. Um, if you go back and you look at some of the other things that we've done, like on your antiderivative sheet, and if you don't have that out and you want to today, it might be helpful. Um, it almost looks like, like an arctangent one, but the sign's wrong. If this were arctangent, I would have an addition between them, and I have a subtraction. So it doesn't match that form either. So we get to a place where there's not a good option that we've done so far on how to take this integral, okay? So we need another option to do that, and that is partial fractions. So the way that this works is we start by taking, well, first we look at the degree of the numerator. It's not bigger than the degree of the denominator, so we're on to step two. So we look at the denominator, and we, have, we factor it, okay? So that obviously is algebra. So if I were to factor this denominator, <coughs> what will this denominator factor into? 2x plus 1 and 2x minus 1. Okay, pretty good so far. That's literally step two, factor the denominator. 
Now step three says to write the denominator as a summation of fractions. So here's what that means. It means we're gonna write two separate fractions, one with one of the denominators and the other with the other denominator. And there's going to have to be numerators, but that's kind of the point of partial fraction decomposition is I need to figure out what those numerators have to be in order to make this work. And it's not altogether obvious. Okay, you can't just sort of guess and check and make this work as a general statement um, for, for the problems that we're going to do. It's not obvious, all right? So here's what we do. We move on to step four. So step four says that we're going to write the numerators with degree one less than the denominator and the exception piece we'll see coming later. It, it doesn't apply yet, okay? Degree one less. So what is the degree of each one of these denominators? One. one. So what's one less? Zero. So what does it mean for something to have a degree of zero? It's a constant. It's a constant. Okay, everybody good with that? I have linear denominators. I'm going to have a constant numerator. And constant that we don't know, we generally let be a letter. And we're going to let it be the letters A and B. Okay, as we move forward and we use capitals, I'm not really sure that there's a specific reason for that. But that is the convention for doing these, is to use capital letters and we just go down the alphabet. So if we need another one, we use a C. If we need another one, we use a D, and we just keep going, and we'll see some examples. Okay, so this is steps two through three, two, three, and four, excuse me, two through four, um, and they were all really fast, right? We factored it, we wrote it as a summation, and we wrote the, wrote the denominators as constants. The finding the constants is the bulk of the, of the process. So reconciling these fractions means literally taking the two fractions and multiplying, not multiplying, but combining them back together, okay? So how do we do that? Well, we take this second, our first denominator and multiply it by the second one, 2x minus 1. And we multiply the second denominator by the first one, 2x plus 1. So we get a common denominator and we sort of push it back together, okay? That feels a little bit counterproductive, but it is not. So bear with me while we do that. We're going to rewrite that numerator now. I'm going to have 2ax, I usually write the constant pieces in front of the variable pieces, minus a. And because the denominators will now match, I'm gonna write them over a single denominator, 2x plus one times 2x minus one, or if you wanted to write it as 4x squared minus one, that'd be fine too. And then I have plus 2bx, plus b. Okay, is that okay? I know it's a mess, but do you see where all the pieces came from? Okay, now if I compare that to where I began, so if I compare this to where I began, these things are equal. Every single step along the way is equal to the step before, right? That's how we work with these. So if you wanted to be more clear about it, we could put equals in front of each of these and that would be maybe a little bit more clear. But what it means is that the original integral that we started with has to equal the integral that we ended with. Now, the denominators clearly already are equal, right? We separated them and then we pushed them back together. It's the numerators where we wanna have a little bit more focus. Now, there's two different kinds of, let me erase the highlighting because it's in my way now. Okay, I can't. Not that way anyway, let's try it again. Okay, it's not gonna let me erase my highlighting. I need to be more careful with that. Okay, um, so what I want is I want to have the numerators um, and notice the pieces that are there. So we're gonna look on top of what I have written. Um, actually, you know what, let me do it this way. I don't really care about the first denom the numerator and denominator, it's the second one that I care about. So uh, this is gonna be equal to the integral of ax, so two ax, sorry, two ax minus a, So what I had, uh, plus two bx plus b, over, and I'll write it the same way as the original denominator, so it's very obvious. These two things are equal. Okay, so the second denominator, the denominator, denominator's not the word I want, numerator. The numerator, the one that's got the a's and the b's in it, has two different types of terms. One type of term has variables, and one type of term does not. So there's variable terms on that numerator, and there's constants on that numerator, right? The ones that have an x in them are the variables. The ones that do not have x in them are the constants. Everybody good so far? Okay. So I have 2ax minus a plus 2bx 
plus b, and it's supposed to equal the 1 that's in the numerator on the other side. They have to be the same if I'm going to have the denominators the same and the integrals are also the same. These have to be the same. But what I notice is that there's some terms that have x in them, and there's some terms that are just numbers. That's a number sign that's not a hashtag, okay? That's what it's supposed to be. I tell my children in my house that all the time, and they just roll their eyes. You're going to roll your eyes for me? You guys want to do it? No, you don't want to do it. Okay. All right, so we have numbers and we have x's. On the left-hand side, it's really easy. There's, there's no x's, right? It's just the number 1, and the number is a 1. That's the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, the ones with the a's and so forth, which pieces have x's in them? 2ax, what else? 2bx. These pieces all have x's in them. So the 2a plus the 2b. So I'm just removing the x value, right? It, I'm, I'm associating, I'm just getting the, the coefficients in front of x and I'm associating them. And then how many, or not how many, but what values don't have an x in them? These pieces, right? The negative a and the positive b. Okay, everybody good? What we have here is we have a system of equations. There's two equations, and there's two variables, and you know two ways to solve this. You actually know three, but two ways that are like helpful, most helpful. What are ways that you can solve systems of equations? Subtraction. Okay, so subtraction, elimination, or addition. Different resources call it different things. So that method, that's one method. Substitution, Substitution is the other method. And Technically, you can do it with graphing, and you can also do it with matrices. Um, okay, Th those are two other options, but they're not really like ones we can go to. Tend to go to, sub to the subtraction, addition, elimination method, whichever number, name you called it, or we go to the um, substitution method. This one works really well with elimination. Um, is that the one I wanted to do? Uh, actually, it does. I just don't have it written the way I want it yet. So let me rewrite the top one just a second. Um, I can divide everything by two here really nicely and then it'll work really well with elimination. So this is a plus b equals zero. Um, so if I use these two, because I divided everything by two, elimination works really nice. So I've got one on the left, and I have two b on the right. What does b equal? One half, thanks so much. b is one half. Uh, and if b is one half, you can use either of those equations then to find a. If b is one half, I'm going to use the 0 equals a plus b. What will a be? A would be negative 1 half. So taking this and putting it in here, I can find out that a is negative 1 half. Okay, so you might be looking at that and saying, okay, well, I mean, that clearly isn't college algebra because you have integrals all over everywhere. And that, that's true. I do have integrals on the paper, but I haven't done anything with them yet, right? All I did was take a fraction and I separated it out, I pushed it back together, and I was actually able to, I was about to actually write it as two separate fractions that are combined going to be equal to the one we started with. So we haven't done any calculus yet. So what that means I can do is that I can take this version over here. Before I put in the red pieces, and I'm gonna rewrite it. I'll rewrite it on my next slide without those red pieces put in. So this is where we actually started when we first separated it. We wrote this as, whoa, a over 2x, was it plus or minus what I did first? Did you plus? Okay. And then I had b over 2x minus 1. That's how I read it? Okay, good. That's definitely not what my notes say. No, I'm not going to look at my notes. Um, so we had a value for a. What did we say a was? A is negative 1 half. So I can put it in there. And what was my b? It was 1 half. Okay, that's the college algebra component. Now, that's not a very pretty looking set of fractions, admittedly, um, but I can use some properties of integrals and now I am gonna do the calculus part of it. I can actually rewrite this with the negative one half in front. So this is negative one half the integral of one over two plex plus one, and then plus the positive one half in front of the integral of one over two x minus one. Yeah, now I can use u sub, and what is the general antiderivative that I'm going to end up with after I do some u sub? What happens when I have this form? 
Natural logs. Yeah, I'm going to get some natural logs that are coming about. So I do have technically two different U subs. So we'll do a U sub for the first one. What would you like the U sub to be, Adrian? Uh, U sub. Just give me 2x plus 1. It is. It's 2x plus 1. Yep. It's not a very exciting U sub. The derivative is going to be 2x dx. And I, I don't have, um, I should probably, since I separated and put a dx here as well. Um, I don't have a 2 in my problem, so I would need to divide that to the other side. Oh, 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 sorry. Two is what I meant to do. I was getting ahead of myself. Uh, two. There we go. I don't have a two in it, so there would be a division. Actually, I was using red. Well, you keep using red. By two to the other side. Um, so this two that I'm dividing by can come out and join my negative one-half in front and make it a negative one-fourth. <coughs> And then this integral will be 1 over u du, right? Um, I'll call it a v substitution. I'm going to use one of these later anyway, so now we'll just use it here because technically it's not the same as the u I just did. So it would actually be 2x minus 1, although it's not that much different. What's its derivative? 2 if I write it right. And then dx, and we'll divide by 2. And again, it will join the one half out in front. So now I have a positive one fourth integral of one over v dv. Okay, so we already said that this is a natural log. Natural log of what? In a minute before that. Oh, Sophia got it. Absolute values. Remember those absolute values? We need those absolute values. Uh, we do. So natural log of the absolute value of u, and then plus, we have a one-fourth, and we have the natural log of the absolute value of v, and plus c. That's right. My Calc 1 students are working on this new idea of plus c's right now as well. Um, I want to combine these, uh, and I want to change them back into the u's and the v's back into x's. So let me change them back into x's first. So this is negative one-fourth natural log of the absolute value of 2x plus 1, and then plus the one-fourth, and it's the natural log of the absolute value of 2x minus 1 plus c. Um, okay, so, so technically I understand there's really nothing wrong with leaving it written that way, but it's easy enough to combine logs back together that I would expect that you would do it, okay? So if we have the ability to combine the logs into a single log expression, we're going to do so. This log expression both has a one-fourth, so we can leave the one-fourth in front if you wish. So ignore the one-fourths for the moment. But this one is negative, and this one is positive. So what am I going to do with my logs? We're gonna, we can change the order, that's true, but what will I end up doing to combine them? Dividing. So when, there's, when the logs are subtracted, they can be combined with the division of the interiors. So I'm not even going to take the time to rewrite it, although if it, if it feels like you should see it to do that, please feel free to do so. The way that this has to work, and it is still in absolute values, but the way that this has to work is that the positive one would go on the top, right? So that's 2x minus 1. And the negative, the one that has the negative in front of it, would go on bottom. So that's the 2x plus 1 plus my c. Um, if you wanted to bring the one-fourth up and make it a fourth root, that'd be great. But that's not any simpler. Having the coefficient or having the radical, four, you know, with a, with a radicand of four, doesn't, neither of those are really different. So this is perfectly fine. We've condensed it as much as it really can be condensed. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. So this is the hardest one to reconcile that we're going to do, but it's the cleanest one in terms of seeing how they break apart. Adrian. This might be a little off topic, but I'm just curious. Like, when would we uh, use something like this in like the real, real world field? Well, it, so it depends on what kind of function you're working with, right? Because functions show up in lots of different ways. Um, and usually, like in real world context, it's a model that came from something else. And models can have all kinds of forms. And so when we're working with any kind of, uh, any kind of concepts in calculus specifically, these are the four courses that many of you are going to end up taking, what we're trying to look at is what happens when modeling gives you things that look different. And so if this shows up in a modeling context, it models a set of data very well or whatever, we have to be able to work with it. Does that make sense?
that, I mean, that's the real answer is that modeling comes up with all sorts of strange functions. So, okay. all right. So this one definitely looks different than the one before. Um, it has more on top for one reason, right? Um, the denominator also factors a bit differently. Um, there's a couple of things that are going to happen with the just denominator that provide um, some differences from what we just did before. Um, but finding the numerators is actually going to be easier. Um, it's not going to think, you're not going to think it is at the beginning, but it will be easier as we work through them, okay? So bear with me on that. Um, for starters, numerator is not bigger than the denominator, right? So we sort of get to get skip step one. Step two said that we're supposed to factor the denominator. So how will this denominator factor? All right, so we're going to pull out an x squared and then what? x plus 1. Okay, everybody good with that? Okay, so probably your gut reaction is that this is two separate factors and I would make two fractions, right? Your gut's wrong. There are three factors here. You just didn't realize it. The difference between this one and the last one is that one of my factors is squared. So we are going to separate this into having, indeed, one squared factor. I'll write it in the middle. But I'm also going to have a factor of x. That is the non-squared piece of that, and I'm going to have my x plus 1. So let's just pause and think why that happened. Right, so the whole point in fraction decomposition is to take the denominator and separate it out into as many different ways as we could have multiplied the fraction denominators together and ended up with this x squared times x plus 1. We could have had an x squared and an x plus 1 only, and if we do, this, end up, this will end up having a 0 as a numerator. Like, that's a possibility. We could end up seeing one of these pieces drop out, okay? Like, that, that, that could happen. But it might also have some other numerator there that we're going to be able to be working with, okay? So these are all three pieces that when we merge them back together would have a common denominator of x squared times x plus 1. So we write all three of them down. Now, the first one has degree 1 as a denominator, right? Where did it come from? Where did what come from? Just the x by itself. Um, okay, so let's think what happens. Uh, I'll, I'll erase this in a second. But if we were to try to put this back into us, like find a common denominator, what would I have to do? Well, I would need this one to be multiplied by x and x plus 1. And I would need to have this one multiplied by x plus 1 and this one multiplied by x, right? So it comes from the fact that if I were to try and take fractions and turn them into a common denominator that looks like this, all three of these things are possible denominators that could be present and be created in such a way that multiply back together to give me the denominator that I started with. So I want to have all of the different factorable pieces of the denominator that could exist to give me that denominator when I multiply it back together. And x is one of those options. It feels awkward. I realize that. It only happens when you have a squared piece in the denominator. But the last one uh, it should be x squared. I was yeah. so concerned about the other piece. Thank you. Yeah, it would be x squared. Uh, and we will do all of those pieces and merge them back together in a moment. Maybe I'll just leave the red, the red written there because we're about to do it anyway. Brayden. So if you had x cubed, Ooh, thank you for asking. Yes, it would. If you had x cubed, you'd have to write it three times, wouldn't you? You'd have to write an x and an x squared and an x cubed. Yeah, you would. It's because, it's not because they all equal zero, it's because they're all factors of one another, factors and multiples of each other, yeah. And so basically we're trying to find all the factors of x cubed, was your example, and all of the factors of x cubed would include both x, x squared, and x cubed. And we want to have a denominator that has all of those individual factor pieces. Preston's like, please don't give me an x cubed. I can just tell it right on his face. I don't think I have one. I don't think you're going to see one, but it's not impossible to expect, okay? Uh, all right. So ignore the red pieces, but I'm going to need them in a minute, so I'm going to leave them there. The black piece in this first denominator, just the x, is linear, right? So it means the numerator is going to have a constant, correct? Degree zero. And my, I told you before, we were going to use the letter a first, so it's going to be a. All right, so you ready for the exception? Technically, this denominator, x squared, 
is cubic or is, is a, a quadratic, right? So my numerator should have degree one less. What's one degree less than power two? Power one, which would be linear, okay? And so, and we will see an example of when we're gonna do this. A linear function has the form like y equal mx plus b. Um, we're gonna use the letters in order. So we would like, if we were doing it right now, we would write down bx plus c. All right, we need a linear piece, that's the x piece, and we need a constant piece. But when we have these duplicated denominators, this is the exception, we don't have to do that. We actually are able to write it as a linear factor at, in the top, um, not a linear factor, a constant factor in the top as well. So this is the caveat. When we have these repeated denominator pieces where they have this factor in common x and x squared, we get to do, we get, it's not cheating, but we do get to do something easier anyway. We get to have a constant numerator as well. Okay, we'll see the linear numerator on the next example. So, so bear with me on that, we will get to that. Okay, this is the cheat spot. Now, this next piece also has a linear numerator or denominator. So it's gonna have another constant numerator. They're all constants on this one. Okay, everybody good? All constants. And we're gonna merge them back together. Well, this denominator was multiplied by x times x plus one, so the numerator will be as well. This denominator is multiplied by x plus one, so the numerator will be as well. And this denominator is multiplied by x squared, so this numerator will be as well. So as I merge them back together, I need to get a common denominator. And briefly, it's going to look like a mess. It will clean up faster than you can imagine, but briefly, it's going to look like a mess. We need to multiply this out. So somebody tell me what this, and it'll all have the same denominator now. So the denominators will all be back to x squared times x plus one. What will this, new, what will this first numerator be? ax squared plus ax. Everybody good? How about the second numerator? bx plus b. And my third numerator, cx squared. And we all said, yes, in fact, that does not look very nice. It looks, like it looks, looks terrible. Looks terrible, doesn't it? Okay. But remember the point. The point is, we'll use a highlighter that's lighter so that it doesn't get in my way as much. The point is to compare this numerator that's got these a's and b's and c's in it back to the original numerator. And we're going to do it like we did over here, where I identify the numbers and the variable components. Right? So if I look at all of these pieces, what I have is I have some terms that have an x squared in it, I have some terms that have an x in it, and I have some terms that are just constants, they're just numbers. Let's identify the original question that I was, original question that I was given's numerator and tell what those are. So what is the coefficient for x squared in my original problem? It's a four. What's the original variable number in front of the variable x? A two. And what's the original constant that I was given? A negative one. And just like on the last problem, if it weren't given, Oops, I went on this one. If it weren't given, right, like there's no x in that first original numerator, then that means it's a zero. Because zero times x would be the same thing as not having it. Okay, so this one has all three pieces. How about in the values at the bottom? Which pieces have x squareds in them? A and C. A and C. So that's A plus C. Okay, which, which pieces have um, the x's in them? A and B, so that's an A plus B. They happen to be positives on each piece. And then how about my constant terms? B. It's just B. This is, this is why this problem's really nice, is because we already know one of them before we start. Like, yeah. in general, this could be bad, right? Three variables, three unknowns. It starts to look a little bit more like matrices might be helpful. I mean, right? But it's not as bad as it looks, okay? We know what one of the variables is. We know that b is equal to negative one. But if I know that b is equal to negative one, can I figure out what a is? Yeah. I should be able to really easy, right? So if I know that b is equal to negative one and I put that into here, I now have two equals a minus one. And what would a have to be? a would have to be three. And if I now know that a is three 
and b is negative 1, I can use this one and I can figure out what c would have to be, right? So I have 4 equals a, which is 3, sorry, I meant to put a 3 there, 3, and then plus c, and what would c have to be? It c would also be a 1. So I get the a, b, and c actually really quickly on this one. All right? I really do. So I need to take this, this expression right here and put the a's and b's and c's in it. So I'm going to move this over to the next slide, and then we'll put the a, b, and c in as we saw it. So I had a over x plus b over x squared plus c over x plus 1 dx. That's the original um, piece where I put the a's, b's, and c's in. And we just found out, what was a? A, 3? I think it was 3, right? Yeah. And b was, was it 1 or negative 1? b was negative 1, so I'll put the negative in front, so negative 1 over x squared. Uh, c was actually positive 1 over x plus 1 dx. <clears throat> okay, now the last problem we did had some logs that came out of our antiderivative. Is this one going to have logs? It is. How many? Two. One of them is not going to have a log, though. Which one's not going to have a log? The one over x squared is not going to have a log. Okay, so how do we decide if something's going to end up having a log as a part of the antiderivative and when something's not? Has to be a degree of one. So both in the 3 over x piece at the beginning and at the 1 over x plus 1 piece at the end, the degree of the variable in the denominator is a 1. Those pieces are going to end up being logs. The one in the middle, though, isn't. Correct? We've got an x squared term. Now, it might be helpful to rewrite this, and I will. And if you don't want to rewrite it, you don't have to. But I'm going to rewrite my pieces. So I have this piece here. This one is actually going to be written in my world as x to the negative 2 dx. Uh, and then the last one is 1 over x plus 1, which technically has a u substitution. But if the first u substitution we did a minute ago was uninteresting, this one's even less interesting than that one. Um, and let me just remind you why. If I let u be my denominator, what is the derivative of that u? It is just 1 dx. So as I sort of think about rewriting this, it doesn't really need any substitution changes because its derivative is 1. So I'm not going to write it down that way um, on that one. Uh, on the first one, though, I have the natural log of absolute value of x, right? 3 times the natural log absolute value of x. What's the antiderivative of x to the negative 2? x to the negative 1 over negative 1. Good. And then the last piece, what's the antiderivative of 1 over x plus 1? Natural log of the absolute value of x plus 1. Plus c, plus c. yeah, OK. Um, we're going to clean up a couple things. Um, we're going to combine the logs that we do have. OK, we can do that. Uh, we also have this one right here written with a negative exponent and a double negative is going on. It's kind of just messy looking. We can, we can change that. So this piece I'm going to change real quickly to make it um, nicer looking. So it's going to be positive 1 over x, uh, just 1 over x, actually. I was about to say x squared, but it's not 1 over x. That's the middle piece. Um, okay, so I would like to be able to combine the logs. They are added together, which means how will they be combined? They'll be combined with multiplication. But that ability to combine them with multiplication assumes that they either don't have a coefficient at all, that, that is to say they'd have a coefficient that matched to number one, or that we remove any coefficient that we do have that doesn't match. This three can't stay here and be combined yet. What do I have to do with a three in order to combine my two logs together? I have to make it an exponent, right? So this first one is actually going to first be rewritten as the natural log of absolute value of x cubed. And then this other one was already having a coefficient of 1, so it doesn't need to be rewritten. It's just going to just, it doesn't need to be changed. It just needs to be rewritten, I should say. Um, and now I'm actually able to combine this log and this log together. So whether you combine them first or whether you combine them second, doesn't matter. You're going to have a 1 over x. And then they're going to be combined with multiplication. 
So we have an x cubed and we have x plus 1 and then plus c. Uh, and they do still need the absolute values. There is the ability for that piece that's inside of there still to be um, negative um, in some, with some values. Can they have the same positive? The constant would stay the same on the outside. It could, yeah. And that's what happened on my 1 fourth where I didn't really have to pull yeah. it up. Yes, if the constants matched in front, we could leave it on the outside. Yep. OK, any questions on that one? OK, I need you to see one that has a linear um, numerator next. So this one right here doesn't, it doesn't have the degree of the numerator bigger than the degree of the denominator. What's the degree of the denominator? Let's just do that first. What's the degree of this denominator? 4. The degree of this denominator is a 4. Does everybody see that? OK, what's the degree of the numerator? 2. OK. So, and the second thing where it asks us to factor the denominator is actually really nice because the denominator is actually already factored, correct? So if I were to take the denominator and I were to then write it as two separate denominators, what would those two denominators be? x squared plus 9 and x squared plus 9 squared. Right? If the denominators were both x squared plus 9, you would never multiply them together to get a common denominator because they'd already be in common. Are you with me? If this squared's not here, what's the common denominator? x squared plus 9, not x squared plus 9 squared. Yeah? So one of the denominators is x squared plus 9, and the other one is x squared plus 9 squared. All right. This denominator, the first one now, is a quadratic which means its numerator needs to be linear, not a constant, but linear. Linear equations, lines, have forms like y equal mx plus b, right? And if you wanted to use an m and a b, you could totally do that. It wouldn't be a problem. Feel free. But the normal convention here is to use the letters a, b, c, d, and so forth. So I'm going to write mine as ax plus b. OK, linear numerator, quadratic denominator. But here's the cheat step. Because my denominators are the same, it's just that one of them has a power of 2 on it. Even though the second denominator here is a power of 4, right? This is a, this is a degree 4 on the denominator. So technically, if I had a degree 4 denominator, I should be doing a degree 3 numerator. That would mean, if I did it, that I would need a cx cubed plus dx squared plus ex plus f all of that on the numerator. But I don't have to do that. The reason I don't have to do that is because the denominators are the same, but one of them's a power of the other one. So I get to ignore the fact that this has a squared on it, and I get to treat it just like as though it said ax, or I'm sorry, x squared plus 9. And I get to treat it like it's a quadratic, which means its numerator gets to be linear. And after b would be c, so it's cx plus d as the numerator. OK? Now, if I'm merging these back together to get a common denominator, one of them doesn't have to do anything to get that to happen, right? The second one doesn't need to be multiplied by anything. But the first one does. What does the first one need to be multiplied by? Yeah x squared plus 9, top and bottom. So on the numerator of the first fraction, I'm going to get a bunch of pieces because it's actually going to have to be foiled out, right? All right, so somebody tell me, what do you get if you foil or distribute out this first numerator? I'll start you out. AX cubed. Now what? Say it again. 9AX. Cool. What else are we going to get? We're going to get a BX squared and 9B. Thank you, Braden. Um, the second numerator will stay as is, so it's just still CX plus D. And the denominator is now the combined denominator X squared plus 9 squared.
Now, that numerator looks awful. I, I, I hear you. Nobody said it, but you're all thinking it. Right, Levi's like, yeah, of course we were. Okay, but like the last problem, things are gonna drop out and fall out really quickly, okay? So we're gonna compare this to this. What's the highest x uh, degree, degree on x that we have in either of those numerators? Cubed, there is an x cubed. There is an x squared, there is an x, and there is a constant. So we will start with the original numerator. How many x cubes do I have in my original numerator? None, <laughs> right, zero, there's none. How many x squareds do I have in my original numerator? One. How many x's do I have in my original numerator? Negative one. And how many numbers or constants do I have? I have nine. Okay, is everybody good with that for my original numerator? Okay, I'm gonna have to make everything smaller. It's too big. All right, how about the one that's highlighted in yellow at the bottom? How many x cubes do I have? Or what are the coefficients of the x cubed pieces in the, the denominator at the bottom? A. A. Just A on it. Yeah, cubed. Squareds, though, what do I have? Just B. How about linear terms? I have the C, and I have the 9A, right? Okay, so I have C plus 9A, or write it the other way if you wish. How many, or what coefficient, what constants do I have? Just D. These separate out very nicely, and in fact, you know two of your values immediately. Yes, ma'am. Did I miss one? Uh, I did. So that's the end two. 9B here. Thank you. Okay, did I get them all this time? Okay, so we know two of the values immediately. Which two values do you know? A and B. A is zero, B is one. So I can use those values now to figure out what C and D are. Let's just go in order and find C. Okay, so I've got negative one equals C plus nine A and A is zero. So what's, that's not looking very good. Let's try again. What is C going to be? Yeah, C is gonna be negative one. So now I've got C. <clears throat> and my last equation says nine equals D plus nine B, but B is one. So what's D going to be? D would have to be zero. I have my four values now. And they came about pretty quick, right? So you really cannot tell. I mean, like, let's be real. The very first example I did looked like the easiest of the three that we were going to do, did it not? But figuring out the A and the B was the most, I don't want to say it was like super terrible, awful, but it was the most work of the three that we've done. Okay, so you cannot just look at it and know how hard these problems are going to be. Some of them that look kind of messy and ugly end up being very simple, and some of them that look very simple end up being kind of messy and ugly. All right, we can rewrite this, though. I now had, well, I originally had, let me write it. I had ax plus b over x squared plus 9, and then I had cx plus d over x squared plus 9 squared. All right, and we figured out what the A and the B and C and D are. So what will we have for our numerator on our first fraction? Just one. What will be our numerator for our second fraction? Negative one X. So in fact, I'll write this negative here and put an X on top there. Okay, now... Lest you thought that every problem like this will end up with logs, this one does not. Why? What, say again, the degree looks like it's more than one in the denominator. Now, you still might have a log on the second one. It's a possibility um, because I do have something that looks like it might be substitution on the second one, right? Maybe. But the first one for sure is not going to give me anything with logs. Um, on that one. It would on this one. You're right. And I don't mean to make that quite so tiny. Sorry about that. I was trying to get it smaller. I didn't need it that small. 
Um, you're right. On this one, it would be u squared on the denominator. So we would still end up with something that wasn't going to be logs in that second one as well. Um, so now what? Well, that first one does have a form that's familiar. Not as familiar as a log form, but do you know what it is? It's an arc something. It's an arc tangent. Yeah, you picked one. Okay. Yeah, so if you flip back and you look at your arc trig functions, it is an arc tangent. Um, and it's an arc tangent that's actually kind of nice the way it's written. So arc tangent uses this piece that's squared, so it's just x that's being squared here. This piece that's squared is actually 3 that's being squared, right? All right, so if you look back at your arc tangent form, your arc tangent form will tell you what needs to be done for this part of the problem. What in the world does arc tangent give you as the antiderivative using the x and the 3 as the, I think they use U and A on their paper or something like that. A couple of you getting them out. Do you want to do it first, Preston? What's it look like? What does it look like we would have for that first one, not one, the second? One third mm -hmm. and x over three. Yes, that is correct. Okay, so that's an application of the antiderivative arctangent formula with the specific values for this particular problem. Now, as mentioned for the other one, however, a u substitution is likely helpful here. So if I let this have a u, what would the u be? Uh -huh, x squared plus 9. So what's du? Mm -hmm, 2x dx. And I do not have the 2, right? So I haven't done this one yet, but let me pull this negative out and write this as an integral. Uh, I need the half, right, that I'm missing, the over 2 part. And this would be written as 1 over u squared du. Um, did you have a question, Braden? Yep. No, uh, it doesn't have absolute values in it. It doesn't have absolute values in the arctangent formula. The reason logs have absolute values is because the domain inside of a log function has to be a positive number. And so arctangent doesn't have that, I don't believe. There is, one there is um, and it has to do with having a radical somewhere. And so having a value underneath a radical that becomes positive is why that shows up, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, but yeah, so it is something to pay attention to as you're taking a look back at your antiderivative formulas. Um, so this is fine. We can rewrite this piece if we wish. Um, hang on. And this would be u to the negative 2 du. So what's the antiderivative of the second piece as it's written with u's? Yep, u to the negative 1 over negative 1 plus my c. Um, and we can replace the u. We can cancel the negatives, right? And we can move the u into the denominator. Are you all good with me doing all those things at the same time? I would not do that in my Calc 1 class. But if you tell me, it's OK. All right, so we're going to have 1 on top. The 2 stays on bottom. The u moves down, but u is x squared plus 9. And it looks like this. And unlike the last two, which happen to have logs so they can be combined, I can't simplify this. I can't combine the arc tangent with the rational function next to it. Like, that's not a thing. All right. Y'all good? Yeah. Okay. Yeah.